So I am reading a piece from Secrets of Romani Fortune Telling. And this book is about divining with tarot, palmistry, tea leaves, and more. But we give a lot of cultural context to these practices that most people don't know are associated with Roma. And Roma are a diasporic ethnic group originally from India, but a long time ago, more commonly known as gypsies, but it's technically the racial slur. And Roma have practiced fortune telling, metalworking, performing, basket weaving, horse trading, all kinds of trades that were um, associated with as survival trades in the face of persecution for a really long time. And this book is both a historical and cultural context to this work of fortune telling. And also Paulina and I share our own personal stories about what it was like growing up in fortune telling families. And we tell you how to do the work that we do in the most respectful way that we can think of. So non-appropriative cultural exchange and cultural um, education. So this section is from the dream divination part of the book, and it's a little bit of the personal narrative. And we're talking about how to interpret dreams and saying that not all dreams are necessarily prophetic. Some of them are to help you process what's going on around you, which is also really valuable. But sometimes we do have prophetic dreams. So this title is Jasmina's Prophetic Dream. When I was in my first year at college, I had a brand new roommate, Sarah, whom I was already very fond of, even though we had known each other only a couple of weeks. She was an adorable, music-blaring, tennis-playing punk in a dog collar, denim dress, and red chucks, and I knew we were going to be great friends, and we still are to this day. I don't sleep well, so I wake up pretty frequently. As such, I have a strong distinction between night dreams and morning dreams, and I've noticed that most of my spiritual healing or processing dreams come at night, and most of my prophetic dreams come in the early morning. One morning, I dreamed that Sarah was driving her car at the time, a sporty red 93 Subaru SVX that she called Back to the Future because it looked like the DeLorean. In the dream... I was like a spirit hovering over her shoulder, and I saw the lights on her dashboard all light up like a Christmas tree, and the car start to shake, and Sarah try to hit the brakes, but they wouldn't work, and she veered off the road and got into a terrible wreck. I woke up gasping, and both of our alarms were going off. I felt fear jangling through my body, and I had a very clear message for her that seemed to come from the dream and not my brain. Sarah, you have to get your car checked out. You can't drive more than a mile. So go to the place next to the school on Williamsburg or Williamson Road. Your brakes are almost gone and they won't make it any further than that. What are you talking about? She said, sitting up in bed and rubbing her eyes. Listen, I know it's weird, but I get messages in my dreams sometimes. And I just had one. And I just know you'll get in an accident if you don't take care of this today, right now. Trust me. Sarah looked at me in silence for a little while. I thought for sure I had scared her off. I hadn't explained my fortune telling or anything about myself that would give this more context. Witchy behavior wasn't that cool or trendy back in 2004 like it is now. I was bullied for being different as a kid and I was worried that my new friend would think I was spooky too. But then she nodded her head and said, okay, if it'll make you feel better, I'll do it right now. Oh, thank you, I said. It would make me feel better. So she left right away and brought back to the future to the nearest auto shop. Later that morning, I ran into Sarah in the hallway of the English building. You were right, she yelled, raising her arms and clenching her fists and clenching her hands into celebratory fists. Everyone in the hallway turned to see what the commotion was about. My brakes were just about to go. The guy at the shop said it was a miracle I made it there in one piece. Damn, you're good. After that, Sarah told the story to all of her friends and news of my intuition spread far and wide. It ended up being great for my little fortune-telling side hustle, and she was my biggest supporter. I was just glad that she and Back to the Future were safe and sound. Thank you. Yay, I love that. <laughs> Saving lives. <laughs> so, I'm Paulina. I am the co-author of Secrets of Romani Fortune-Telling, and I'm going to read... 
a section titled Paulina's Skepticism. Um, and it's supposed to help people kind of navigate through skeptic um, clients or, or situations where people are skeptic. So <clears throat> I like to tell skeptical clients that I'm a skeptic too. When discussing my belief in divination, I often draw parallels to my religious upbringing in Catholicism and how my perspective has over time now shifted from being religious to being spiritual. Some days the notion of a higher power and all texts in the Bible resonated deeply, while on other days I couldn't even wrap my head around it. I realized that I was struggling with Catholicism as a doctrine and that made me doubt my faith in everything. Despite my many efforts to renounce my belief in God, though, I just couldn't shake the feeling there was something bigger than me and us as humans out there. That's when I realized that I could just believe in what felt true to me and remain skeptical about everything else. I'm not Catholic anymore, but I do believe in a higher power, but in a way that's personal to me. Finding a balance became my answer, steering clear of doctrine or steering clear of doctrinal extremes. My relationship with my God has never been better. Similar to the fluctuations I experience in my religious convictions, my outlook on fortune telling has had an ebb and flow over the years. I found harmony in my healthy skepticism, and it's become part of my approach to fortune telling. It makes me more grounded. It makes me a more grounded reader if I take everything with a grain of salt and acknowledge my faith and acknowledge my human fallibility. Telling my skeptical clients that I know and agree that divination isn't a perfect science helps them trust me more. I'm not going to pretend that I know everything, but I do believe in what I do, and believing in divination and how it can work is personal like my belief in God. I encourage them to enjoy the ride, and that usually softens their reservations. Transparency is key, and this is a lesson I've gleaned from lived experience. I tell my clients that what unfolds during a fortune telling session isn't set in stone. My guiding influences in the divinatory arts impressed upon me that fortune telling is an exploration of the highest probability. It allows for flexibility and for the client to alter their path by changing their perspective and making decisions. My ancestors literally believe it was invented to be used as a tool to warn against or change the future. In essence, fortune telling at its best encourages adaptability and a nuanced understanding of the intricate web of life. In fortune telling, business, it's reasonable to wonder whether admitting doubts about your own craft or spiritual path could make you seem less credible. But the skeptic is not having doubts about something tried, trusted, and tested, like the work of a shoe cobbler or a pilot. Fortune telling isn't a science, and it isn't brain surgery, so they don't need to treat it so seriously. When you're open about your struggles or doubts, it builds trust with people. They see you as genuine not just someone trying to look perfect. It makes the whole experience more authentic and connects you with clients on a deeper level. It brings the human element back into it. So in the world of fortune telling, being honest about your own journey can be a key to building strong, meaningful relationships with those seeking guidance. Remember, just because you are being honest, you still need to remain confident, calm, and professional. 